kind of in place. So I think everybody's here who's got it over here. So I think Matthew Run is possibly, we'll, we'll get to apologies. But I think just for the sake of avoidance of doubt, we've started the meeting, we intend to finish it before we stop. So there's no ambiguity about that. We've got other commitments as the day goes on. We've got a large agenda and we've also got our external audit here who has timelines to keep to as well. So we'll stick to the agenda and we'll go on to the meeting's finished. So first item on the agenda is said in it and apologies. Okay, thank you Chair. We've got eight members present this afternoon, I believe. Uh, Councillor Ingalls is in the building as well. He certainly was earlier, so he should be here. If he's not here, not be long, I don't think. But my understanding is Councillor Ronnie is in apology. I haven't heard for Wally. Okay, no, declarations of interest. Any members got any declarations of interest? Mm. No, nope, nothing. Minutes for approval item number three. Do you see that being as a, a factual? Yeah. Agreed, no descendants, that's an agreement. Item number four. External audit progress report. So the purpose is to report the Council's external auditors, Grant Thornton, UK LLP presented a plan of the work they intend to undertake for the 2018-19 financial year to, uh, to the Audit Risk Security Committee back in February 7. The plan highlighted the audit work necessary to ensure the Council has in place sound arrangements for, for producing accurate financial statements, for maintaining an effective internal control and for managing its performance. So, I'm going to ask it. Aye, go on. I'm just going to ask. I'm, just, I'm trying to see it. That's Angelo Gustinelli, is it? Gustinelli? Andrew? Yeah. Press the mic on, please. Aye. So is it's that yourself. Better? Aye. Or just so you can hear me next door. Great. Yes, yeah, sorry. I'm Angelo Gustinelli, a manager from Grant Thornton, and I'm here today to present the progress paper in relation to the Dumfries and Galloway Council external audit for 2018 19 financial year. So, as you touched on there, Ian, um, that we presented our plan, which laid out essentially the audit methodology, our significant risks, and the sort of timeline in which we hope to complete our audit work um, over the summer. And essentially all this paper is that we've put in front of you today is just an update essentially on the progress since we issued the plan. So the most, I'd say that possibly the most interesting aspect of it is the first slide essentially just teeing out the sort of key, the key areas of work and essentially some commentary on where we are around that, with the first one just being on the, the completion of our planning procedures. So essentially we've completed the, the audit planning procedures and that sort of fed into our tailored risk assessment and um, now we've got quite a defined audit approach which we're going to execute over the year end. And although I've said we've completed it, Planning is a sort of ongoing cycle as part of an audit. So essentially, it's not that we set something at the, at the beginning, at the beginning point, if you like, and then rigidly, rigidly stick to it. Um, it's a continuous process, and that will sort of evolve as we go through the audit process. As we've already touched on, the, the annual audit plan came to the Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee in February, and that detailed a quite a lot of the interesting aspects of an audit, or as interesting as the aspects can be of an audit. And, um, and since then, what we've what we've delivered is our interim work. So, the whole purpose of the interim audit is essentially to give us a little bit of a head start and make sure that we're we're, have, we're delivering an efficient audit. And again, that we're teasing out any significant risks that we may want to capture as part of our year end work. And because the year end works, it's, it's a sort of tight time scale. So we try to essentially do a bit of the testing. So we've done. We've already conducted testing procedures over the first nine months of income and expenditure, and we'll roll that forward and, and complete the testing at the, at the year end. We've also done um, business process detailed walkthroughs over sort of key financial controls areas, I don't, obviously being your payroll, income, expenditure. And as I've mentioned, we've completed that risk assessment and we've reviewed um, minutes to date and, so the, and the supporting papers to those minutes. Um, in terms of our reporting to Audit Scotland in relation to the Increase and Gallery Council, We've submitted all the quarter, the quarterly flood returns. So I think essentially that was, I think that was less frequent last year. And Audit Scotland actually asked us to up the frequency of that. So what we do is we reach out to the finance team and ask them if there's been any frauds essentially communicated to them. And then what we do as well is we review all the necessary minutes to sort of draw our own conclusion. And obviously, if anything comes through our, our interim, our planning, and our year-end work, this above that 5K threshold, we report that across to to Audit Scotland. 
and it's a similar issue in terms of completing the current issue returns. So for something that's essentially brought to our attention that that's may, may be of interest or it's got on, we communicate that so that they can they can sort of keep they're keeping all it's got on in the loop. Um, we've also conducted a little bit of our wider scope work. So the wider scope is essentially the work that we have to do beyond the financial statements. So previously we would come in and essentially we'd test those those numbers in the primary statements being your balance sheet and your, your statement of expenditure and income. Um, but Audit Scotland have actually asked us to extend our remit a little bit. So now what we focus on is four areas of wider scope, being your financial management, financial sustainability, um, value for money, and what's the third one? This is still loading me, it'll come back to me. Um, it will come back to me. Um, it, uh, I, was, I, was, I was going, it's going well there. There's a, there's a fourth dimension, it's, it's escaped my mind, it'll come back to me. But essentially that work's been totally dominated by the best value uh, review that we did with Audit Scotland last year, the best value assurance report. So a lot of the, the, the wider scope work will be actually covered and just following up from the areas that we identified as part of that report. Um, so, so essentially that's the main body of the update. There's, there's a little bit more detail in there just around the significant audit risks that we've teased out. I would suggest that looking at the page number three of the plan, the, the top three there, like sort of standardised risks um, that we can't really get away from, and, and that's because essentially the, the audit auditing standards essentially identifies these as risks that, that span all entities, and that's really around the management override of controls given the position that management are in. So this sort of details a little bit of the testing that we're going to do um, to get comfort that that's not happening. Um, Similarly, there's always a, a, a risk of fraud in relation to expenditure and also in income because these are the, the balances that you would manipulate in order to essentially window dress or make your financial position look stronger than, than it otherwise would be and therefore we, we need to test them as part of every audit. Um, the, the additional one that we've highlighted this year is actually in relation to the termination, um, the early termination of the waste management PFI contract uh, that, that happened back in September 2018. It's our understanding that the council went out to an, an external consultant. I think it was, um, I think it was either an Ernst and Young or a, a KPMG. It was one of the, the big four um, professional service firms, and they've actually went away, did quite a substantial um, piece of work in, in terms of how you unpick that and reverse that PFI um, contract. And as part of our um, significant risk work at year end, we will essentially be we'll be looking at that that paper, and um, we can't just take that as, as verbatim. We then need to challenge that ourselves, actually. Uh, so that's the sort of more, actually it's the Aniston Young. So that's the more interesting piece of work that we'll be doing over significant risk at year end. Um, the, the paper then goes on to sort of detail a lot of sector developments and technical updates, which I wasn't necessarily going to go into. Um, it's more there just for your information and it's various pieces of uh, update, essentially pieces of planning guidance and audit guidance that's changed since last year, so we'll be capturing that as part of our audit process. Um, and also, when you get to the very bottom of the update, we've then got the specific considerations as set out in the Audit Scotland planning guidance. And again, Audit Scotland always like to extend the remit of the external auditor and make sure that we're, we're providing value for money for the audits that we're doing. And they've asked us to specifically look at the EU withdrawal, as you can imagine. So within all of the um, ISA 260s, or also known as the annual audit report, we need to give a conclusion as to whether um, an organisation is essentially poorly prepared, prepared or well prepared in relation to, to EU withdrawal. So, so that will be that will be some interesting. That will probably lead to some <laughs> good conversations and, and challenge around that. Similarly, we're looking at the changing landscape of, of public financial management um, and just essentially touching on all these various different aspects of of extended wider scope that we've been highlighted to us by Audit Scotland. Um, including obviously your dependency on key suppliers and, and open, openness and transparency and, and, and all that sort of very, very interesting stuff. But that was all I really wanted to say. However, I'm happy to take any further questions on that. Um, I know that that's quite a lot of sort of audit speak. So if there's anything that, that didn't necessarily make sense or you just want a little bit more detail, I'm more than happy to provide that. But that was all I was really hoping to, to communicate at this point. Thanks very much. I think it was very detailed. Thank you. Quite layman as well, really. It wasn't overly audit speak. I thought it was really good. So, it's open to members and for any points or clarity questions. Sorry, Ian. Ian, come to the hallway first. Hi. Thanks, Sarah. I just noticed on page two, quarterly fraud returns submitted to Audit Scotland with no frauds above 
£5,000 noted, which begs the question, was there any under that figure noted and what procedures are in place to identify them? Um, good question, sorry, if you can hear what I was, I'd said there. Essentially, the reason the £5,000 threshold is a, is a threshold that's essentially given to us from Audit Scotland, and I think it takes into consideration perhaps all this, a little bit of materiality in terms of if you get really, really small stuff um, that's not necessarily going to have a material impact on your financial statements, then Audit Scotland are essentially saying we're not overly interested in that. But in terms of the, the question you then went on to propose, um, we will... We, <sighs> Fraud is an actual thing that is a massive feature in our, our, our audit because essentially what we are hoping to achieve through our audit is um, an, a, a, a true and fair view of the financial statements and ensuring that they are not materially misstated by error or fraud. And that's why when I was discussing the significant risk areas, we talk about fraud in expenditure, we talk about fraud in income. So there's a little bit there around we would be kind of looking out for that and, and designing our test specifically to identify that from an audit perspective, but then obviously you've got a, a robust management structure in place that will have internal controls um, and they should be capturing um, any fraud or any error through the, the normal checks and balances. And as I've mentioned, as part of our interim work, we do business process, um, we capture all the key business processes like your payroll, income, expenditure, fixed assets, and we try to essentially understand where the controls are in that process, if you like and um, the, the checks and balances, if you like. And what we do is we'll test them to make sure that not only are they designed appropriately, but they're actually operating efficiently and effectively. And if an error was to occur, that they would be captured. So that's what we do almost as, as an audit. But you, you have got the reliance of a, a robust finance team who should be doing checks and balances as part of a business as usual. And that's coupled with essentially your third line of assurance, if you like, coming from a, internal audit. So you've got an, intern, an internal, internal audit function um, and they design their plans around risk, and the risk is very, very tailored to fraud, and therefore that's an additional layer of, of sort of comfort that you could take as a committee around, around the fraud. Um, can you possibly um, assist me? I see that um, one of the things that we're looking at with specific considerations um, as set out in the Audit Scotland's planning guidance, we're yep. going to look at the dependency on key suppliers, which talks about um, key supplier failure and underperformance. And I think it comes as no surprise that um, quite a number of us think that this council was a victim of underperformance with respect to um, one of our capital Absolutely. suppliers. Yes. yes. Um, and uh, what I would like to know is whether you would be um, investigating that and looking at that um, with respect to the planning guidance there, whether that is part and parcel of what you would be expecting to do or whether you think that's been done. Um, that's one question. Um, the other question is a very factual question, which is that we appear to have South Lanarkshire Council here, Best Value Assurance Report. Now, I'm assuming that that is not to do with us. That's on page 20. That's just, that's just a bit, essentially an update that that's came out and that's been published and because you guys have recently went through a similar process, I, there was perhaps an interest there. Um, generally what you what you find is that exactly from a BVAR perspective, everybody likes to sort of benchmark themselves against other, other, other councils. That's more for information than anything else. I can come back and answer your first question unless there was anything further. Is that... Fantastic, yeah. So in relation to the first point, it's a very, very good one. So what we will be doing as the external auditor is essentially speaking to the senior management team and trying to get an understanding um, not only of who the key suppliers to the Dumfries and Gallery Council are, but also what internal control, if you like, of what considerations or um, mitigating factors have you put in place to, well, one, ensure that you have oversight of these these key suppliers in terms of their robustness. Are they, go, are they, are they a going concern? Are they struggling financially? As you say, are they underperforming? Are you not getting best value from them? And, um, so, and But then there's the extension of that. There's then the sort of, right, okay, so if that was to happen, what are we going to do about it? So if through that process you identify a key supplier and it's looking like that key supplier maybe 
just for example, for talking sake, maybe undergoing a little bit of financial uh, troubles and they may not, no longer be a going concern. Um, what happens then? Does that flow through to a risk register? Is that being captured in a risk register? Is that being escalated up through the governance structure? Is that being put in front of non-execs so that the right scrutiny can happen over that? Um, basically, what are you guys doing? And then we'll take a judgment on that as to whether or not it's, it's, it's sufficient and it's working well, or there's perhaps still a couple of essentially gaps in the control environment that then we could suggest through our internal sorry through our external audit um, annual report ways around maybe filling those gaps and, and things to consider so that's really from my understanding what we'd be looking at of we the key suppliers I suppose what I took for Jean's question is I don't know exactly what project you were referring to but Northwest Community Campus is one that came to mind and so, so what? I obviously did you run, but so what's happened recently there then? Just to try and because it's ongoing at the moment to putting into practice what you're talking about should be in place. So our contracts with Hub Hubco Southwest or Hub Southwest, Southwest Hubco. So, but there's a contractor on site, and recently there's been more concerns being brought to the attention of the wider public. Then actually, even though we're back into that school, actually a ceiling. There's claims that it fell down, but I think it actually bowed. But there was a, so was a, they put up new. Uh, Acoustic barrier, you could say, in the ceiling. So different type of material is heavier. The ceiling started to sag the way, and then reinforced the, the brackets and such like. So, I see these things. There's, there's other things about maybe security as well. En entering the building, uh, is it going to be a public space? How do they keep the, the separation between the children, and so on and so forth? So I would imagine that would come through the through the committee structure. Children, young people, lifelong learning. But I think for that perspective, there's already already doubts over the original contract because of the quality of work that came through. Now it's the same contractor that's carrying out the work. Hub, Hubco obviously went back and addressed the original company said that. So even though you've you've provided a poor quality level of workmanship, so on and so forth, that's so we'll just keep using you. And now these things are starting to. So I mean, I thought that doesn't really fit into to what you're saying there. But our our main point of contact from a, a council point of view is actually Hubco Southwest, not the not not the contractors doing the work. But so, I mean, think due due diligence, taking into consideration what you've just outlined, should be a, a proper process. It doesn't really fit. Yeah, I totally agree with that. So essentially, if you if you um, procure, procure the services of a supplier and then they let you down, then there should be actions taken to ensure that you're not using that supplier going forward. And obviously, not only that, there should then there's a little bit of there about the remedials, and hopefully you've got a contract in place that's robust and strong enough to hold said supplier to account and make sure that whether it's through a retention payment that's withheld and not paid, or whether it's through I don't know, there's basically detailed stuff that would be detailed within the contract, you need to make sure that essentially you are putting yourself in as strong a position as possible and coming back to the DG1 piece, I think that's an example of perhaps where it didn't happen as well as it should have and we maybe went to went to the lawyers a wee bit and got a settlement probably sooner in the process than because then it then spiralled further and there was further cost then perhaps out with the, the grasp of that settlement. So it's just a little bit around le learning from lessons like that putting controls in place to ensure that the same mistakes aren't happening again in um, invisibility committee through escalation through your governance structure. So if you're doing that and you've got people like yourselves asking the right questions, hopefully it will capture any of these things that have maybe happened in the past that didn't leave us in a very strong position and ensure they don't happen going forward. Thanks for that. Sorry, Jim. I picked up on your point there, but we'll, we'll maybe come back and just touch to that, see how we address that going forward. Is it an issue? Is it not? Should it some should be monitored as, as a committee or not? Is it actually simple looking at that? But when we get to the recommendations, we'll, we'll maybe just touch on that visit. So, Councillor Malcolm Johnston, then Councillor Graham Nicholl, come in just in succession, please. You don't have to come through me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, actually, my, my first point is just going to be on the back of what Councillor Howie said. Uh, yes. With these roads at less than £5,000. Do you ever aggregate them to, you know, because basically you could have one fraud for 50000 which is material, and then obviously you could have 10 for 5000 you know. How does that get reported to you? So they would be reported to us by a number of different uh, mechanisms that we have in place, and I think basically if it was getting to the stage whereby we were given a lot of smaller frauds, we would definitely consider um, creeping, like creeping materiality. So essentially if we in one quarter, I did, there was, say, like you say, six frauds identified out of £1,000. That, would, to me, would be a breach of the threshold, and then they would be getting reported collectively. And also, there'd be a wider question being asked around, wait a minute, what's happening to the internal control environment here? Why are we getting all these frauds? And you did need to be a little bit of a pushback in terms of, 
analysis is, is the nature of them? Is there a common source? What's the root cause? Like, it, there'd probably be a bit of an investigation essentially off the back of that, or there would, we would encourage that to happen. Um, in terms of what you'd mentioned there, how would we capture that? We capture that through a number of mechanisms. First of all, we come to essentially the, flaw, the fraud liaison officer, if you like, of, of the council and ask, look, has anything been brought to your attention? Um, we then supplement that through our reviews of all the minutes across all the committees and the related papers to see if there's anything in there that might constitute a fraud. And through our interim and planning, sorry, planning interim and year end testing, if we identify a case of a fraud, then that, that would be flagged through, through that process as well. So there's a sort of couple of places that would hopefully, if something was going wrongly and somebody was committing fraud, we would capture that and then be reporting that to Audit Scotland. And it would also flow through into the annual report as well. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I, I've got to say, I think, your, I think your audit plan looks very robust. Um, I'm, I'm actually very impressed with this. Um, we go on to the implications on the existing PFI assets and how that is highlighted in the accounts. Because I think when we, when we, when we came out of the, the waste PFI, the figures came as quite a shock to a number of people. And I would like a bit of reassurance that we're we're going to investigate this quite thoroughly and make suitable allocations or provisions within within the accounts to cover cover these sort of aspects. And and how would you go about showing that? Would you just show it as a, a liability within the accounts? Or? And one that sorry, that's a very good challenge and one that is very very important. And that's why we've actually teased out and identified this as a significant risk. Now, the reality is the nature of these contracts are rather complex and particularly the accounting behind that. In the way that it flows through the accounts, it hits various parts of the accounts. Um, so that's, I think, I've got to compliment the Freezing Gallery Council and actually going out to Ernest and Young and saying, you know what, we need a little bit of help here. We need a bit of consultation around this point. And they've, um, they've got that paper back and they've now shared that with us. So what we, will, we need to do is essentially digest that paper, make sure that we can challenge and scrutinise that paper and push back to anything young if need be. Once we're happy with that approach, then we need to work alongside essentially the finance team to make sure that all those adjustments are processed correctly through the accounts. And that will be captured as part of our financial statements audit and through the additional testing that we'll be doing because we've identified that as a significant risk. So because we've not just essentially, because we've teased that out as being significant, that increases the level of scrutiny and testing that we need to do as auditors. So that's why, hopefully, when we present a paper to you at the end of the audit in our annual audit report, which concludes on a significant risk, there'll be detailed that we identified this particular risk. This is what we said we we're going to do by way of a response, and actually this is the response. And if there is any errors, they'd be flagged up as an audit adjustment, and they would be shown within the report for you guys to really scrutinise and pick at. Um, and hopefully, come the end of that process, all of us will have comfort that that's been, um, been accounted for correctly. Another wee question too is about the uh, equal pay. You mentioned here a contingent liability recognised. Um, do you think that's liable to be significant? I mean, obviously we've had all this stuff from uh, from Glasgow where they've yeah. got themselves in a bit of a pickle with us. And, uh, so my understanding and is that it's that it's not. I mean, it's, it's not as material. Nowhere near as material um, as, as the as the council you had mentioned there. Um, I think. I can't remember the figures offhand, but I'm also I also think quite a lot of it's been settled to date. And I think there's only a residual balance that, from an audit perspective, is is pretty low. But given it's a provision, we will still look at it. And we'll still we'll still ask all those questions, and we'll still pick at that number and make sure that we're comfortable with it at year end. But in terms of there being uh, a, a similar situation occurring at Dumfries and Galloway as is, is, is Glasgow, it's, it's just I don't think, given the numbers we're talking about, that that will be the case. Thank you. Um, I was just surprised, a bit surprised that uh, the vice chair only flagged up one that we'd, where the council had underperformed, one major capital expenditure. But anyway, we are where we are. What constitutes fraud? Well, from my understanding, when we speak about fraud or error, an error to the accounts would be would be essentially made by mistake. A fraud would have been a premeditated act to essentially mislead the users of the financial statements. 
So that's when a member of the finance team or otherwise intentionally um, account for balances incorrectly um, to perhaps make the position of the, the council stronger. Um, but they knew about it and they did it intentionally and, and that's, therefore, that, that's therefore an example of fraud. It's intention as opposed to error, mistake. And also what feeds into that and what sometimes makes it quite difficult for us to capture is because if you've got more than one person um, sort of colluding in fraud, it can make it a little bit more difficult. And that's when we really need to fall back on to having a really robust um, internal control environment and having real, getting real value from your internal auditors in terms of their risk-based approach and, and, the, and the value of the internal audit reports that they're doing throughout the year. So if, a, if, if, if the council issued a contract mm -hmm. to an outside body, mm -hmm. whether it be a social enterprise or a, or a private enterprise and without due diligence without going getting figures and getting the proper information mm -hmm. um, so that the members could make a, a calculated decision mm -hmm. would that be classed as fraud or would that just be bad practice it depends on the circumstances for me so if for example that you, you, you have a member of the council who has providing contracts to a family member. So we would identify that through a related party testing, of course. But like, say, for example, you had that situation occurring, that's fraud because you're, you're defrauding the council. You're, you're essentially, say, for example, you'd put a contract out to your friend for £5,000, but if you'd put it out to tender, you could have got it for £500. That's a fraud to the tune of £4,500 because you've not went through your proper procurement processes and you've not tried to achieve value for money. So for me, it's depending on the circumstances. Um, if it was done in error or for reasonable reasons that perhaps been to the relevant committees and been approved, then that's different. There are situations where that would be the case, but it's very, very based on case by case. If a committee made that decision without going getting the full information, oh. who's responsible for that? Good question. So obviously the committees are the people from an audit perspective that we say are charged with governance, those with charged with governance, that's that's the committee itself. So if for whatever reason it was brought to your attention that the finance team or whomever else was, who are providing reports to the committee were providing reports that were misleading, incomplete, um, not up to the standard that would allow you guys to make informed decisions and do your due diligence, then obviously that would to me be an indication that the finance function or whatever else function was failing that committee and then the committee should take said function and the individual responsible for that to task. Um, if decisions are made by that committee and then they then go on to have a knock-on effect that's, that's negative for the council because that all the, the full picture wasn't painted to them, then that should be, that should be, I would imagine, investigated from my opinion. So I think, so for example, this is stuff that we teased out um, in the Best Value Assurance Report. A big part of what we looked at was the quality of papers that came to the various committees and we spoke out to the various different directors, et cetera, to ensure that that was the case. And from my understanding, it was it was actually, um, there was a point around there being sometimes too much information <laughs> as opposed to too little. Um, so I think that, that from, from the conclusions of the Best Value Assurance Report, I didn't think that that was a risk for this particular council. But yes, that can happen, and that does have serious consequences in the decision making. I think I've pushed that as far as I can, Chair. I think I'll stop now. I think you made it very clear. The only thing you never said was item number five on the agenda for Sipple this morning, and the decision that was made there. No, uh, but that'll be coming to full council on 26th of June, anyways. That's been recalled. So that's another item. But just on picking up on. It's not even a tenuous link, really, because I'm going to come back to points that I've made in external audits. You should really be aware of this, I think. So. Grant Thornton wrote to me as chair of the Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee of the Council, and they also wrote to me as chair of the Audit Risk Committee of the Integrated Joint Board, saying, listen, we need your signature to say you're happy with the, with the, with the structure that's in place, and the anti-fraud corruption zone and so forth. And I said, absolutely, to the IJB, but I said to the Council, not a chance, because I've asked for questions that would lead me to believe that there's potentially fraud and corruption going on. And I still haven't had them questions answered. So I'll give you, for instance, one of them being that a project was uh, went through the committee, at the committee system at the time, at £144,000, and I went and did my own due diligence. Actually, it came to just over £76,000. I said, where's the difference between 144000 it went through and 76000 still haven't got the answer. 
There's another one where, where a local uh, constituent contacted me, local builder. He priced for a, a, a school that was under, undertaking so much. So he went through the, the, the procurement process. He put in a tender of £42,000 and he phoned me up seven or eight weeks later afterwards because he was unsuccessful and says, Leon, what on earth is going on at this school? I'll no name it in the public at this moment in time. I have done in the past, I think, but just to, to earn a side of caution, he said, you've spent all this money on X school. I said, well, what's wrong with that, spending money in schools? He said, well, we spent £116,000 refurbing that school and I, I lost that contract at 42000 What's going on? So I've asked the two, and there's another item as well that I'll not go into, so I'm not getting any answers back whatsoever as chair of the Audit, Audit and Risk Committee, Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee, and that's potential, pr predominantly why I'll not sign that off. But there's other things as well that I'm asking. But I would imagine as the external auditors, you'd be aware of that because I've asked the question. But I think it leads directly into into that. It's I don't know if you've got any viewpoints in regards to that and come back to because it's the questions being asked in regards to what what actually is fraud and actually that you're comfortable that, that the process and procedure are in place to actually firm that up. But I don't know if they are. That's the reason why we asked the question. That right there. So if you aren't get, getting the assurance that you need as the Chair of the Audit and Risk and Scrutiny Committee to essentially confirm in your, from your viewpoint, from your point of view as the Chair and from all the conversations and all the papers and everything and all the other various committees that you are a part of, if you're not getting the comfort that you need and you're asking questions and they're not being answered, then that's the response to that query. Um, is it actually draw, you know, you do have concerns and then you need to then work with uh, with the finance team to understand whether the, whether or not they are legitimate or if whether or not there's actual um, acceptable answers to that. So, for example, you mentioned the, the individual who tendered for a 42,000 versus 116,000. There's lots of different things that go into tendering other than, other than pricing. So it may well be that they had a bad experience with that individual and therefore not necessarily trusted or it could be that the quality piece was quite strong and this individual was reputable and they could you know you're going to do the work really really good and it may well be that the other guy didn't have the same reputation and maybe didn't have the credentials to do the piece of work so there is sometimes other uh, other circumstances the one where you mentioned about the 140k versus the 70k yeah that sounds funny and i would be wanting an answer to that myself and um, so I'll, there's a little bit there around perhaps chasing those responses and seeing if there is um, reason for concern, and if there is reason for concern, then that needs to be flagged to the to us as the, the external auditors, and then we need to design procedures around that as part of our external audit process. We will take that up out with four years of been chasing that answer. <laughs> so it's it's maybe new to yourself, but four years of been chasing it, and it's been getting a close door every time. So maybe we'll start to move. So is everybody content with the questions up till Malcolm and Jane and Jane as well. Mark. Uh, it's just again, I'm, I'm going back to a bit more of the technical questions, I suppose. It was uh, your draft guidance on internal transactions. I mean, that just seems to me like it's just standard consolidated accounts. So the question I've got with that is, is that not what has been happening in the past? And is there a, and a, is there a risk that there's been an element of inflation in our balance sheet with the contra entries making the, the position look greater than it was? Not used to that speaker. Apologies, guys. Apologies. I keep doing that. Um, yeah. So that was, I think that I'm not entirely au fait of that. Where is the where that came from? But the fact that it mentions LASAC, so LASAC's a sort of local government specialist group. Um, in fact, John Boyd, who's the senior manager who I'm attending in place of, is a member of LASAC, and essentially it's the best technical minds in accountancy go to that from a public sector point of view and basically challenge things they don't think are working properly or try and call out gaps. So I don't really know where that was and to how it shifted. I'm not wholly familiar with it, but if it's came from last act, it means they probably identified something that either doesn't make sense, counterintuitive. It's having a, it's not necessarily showing a true and fair position when it's then flown through into the accounts from that particular perspective. Could be a number of reasons, but I'm not entirely sure of the background to that. It's just that what what I find surprising is that it is just a basic standard practice for doing a set of consolidated accounts within group companies and if they've not been doing that in the past I find, I find it rather surprising that it's uh, something that you learn very very early days in your accountancy training. Absolutely, consolidations I remember it very very well from, from my training days and uh, my cast days. It wouldn't have been as something as fundamental as that, it would be a subtle tweak to that, that's all it would be. Um, it wouldn't be that we haven't been consolidating accounts, we haven't been doing that, that's not the case, um, we have been doing that. 
Thank you. Um, it was really, I wanted to go back to the, um, the PFI issue, and, and I do understand that what you've got to do is show a true and fair reflection <coughs> of the position in terms of accounting. Um, but, but the public, obviously, is extremely interested in waste. I mean, really very interested in waste. I think probably we all, all think that they are really quite excited about waste at the moment, uh, of the things that, um, that are floating their boat. And um, while I understand that you're going to, it's, it's a technical issue about how you treat this in the accounts, I think the public's going to be quite interested in the commentary around about the whole process. Because after all, it was meant to be a contract, decades long contract, which was then terminated by one party after 14 years. And um, you know, there is a, a conception out there, uh, quite apart from what we've been doing subsequent to that PFI, um, that that it wasn't a great thing for the council. And I think that I would like the public to be in a position to decide dispassionately whether it was or it wasn't. And so I'm wondering whether what level of commentary you will be able to put in um, with respect to your um, talking about the, um, the, 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 the snapshot of the accounting issue, but then there is quite a bit of commentary around about it, which I think the public will be interested in and will find useful. So I don't know what, what level we, of, of discussion we can expect to see around about it. That, that's a good question. So you're absolutely right. Um, the public are very, very interested in it. My understanding was that essentially it was fit for purpose. Um, PFIs are over by, like say, many decades, 30 odd years. At the time, it made sense. It was um, actually touted as being really forward thinking, and I think the council got lots and lots of plaudits for it. Then things changed. We moved on. Recycling became more important. That didn't necessarily feature in the, the, the existing PFI um, contract with, with your waste managers. Um, and then it became quite political, and then that resulted in it being terminated. And you're right, it's, it's very, very, people are interested in that. It's something that people really, really buy into, particularly now. More so than ever, if he's very, very environmentally conscious, they want to be able to recycle, all that sort of thing. So just to kind of answer specifically the question that you asked, we've teased out as a significant risk, the significant risk over the accounting treatments. So we'll capture that there. But I will take you back to the, the, the when I was initially talking about the wider scope of the audit. So I remember what the fourth dimension was. So financial management, do you have a good financial management team? Are you breaking even every year? Financial sustainability, have you had a forward look? What's the next three to five years looking like? Are you going to be financially sustainable? Um, spoke about value for money, and then the other one was governance and transparency. So that's your governance structure, your scrutiny, all that sort of stuff. So we'll look at that, make sure that we, we think that things are as they should be and tease out any weaknesses. I would fully anticipate for um, there to be additional commentary against this PFI situation, either within governance or and or value for money. Um, and I also am 99% sure there was some commentary in the prior year annual report. However, it happened essentially in the September, and we issued this, this report in September. So it may be brief, but I would fully anticipate there, there, to, be, there to be some commentary around that, because that's something we really need to capture as part of our wider scope, because it is so politically important, really. Remember that European directive that came in that was interpreted by Scottish Government of the day, uh, still the same Scottish Government pretty much, but it was very clear that it had to be recycling at curbside or it. So, and that was the difference that really had that impact. But I suppose, so, so where do we go from here? Have not any other members coming in? Yeah. Uh, no, you're absolutely right, Jane. It was a really good question. It was, absolutely. Oh, sorry. Oh, Pauline, sorry, Pauline. Wrong one. Um, Thank you. Picking up on Councillor Maitland's point a bit, um, with all the recent cuts, we're acutely aware that there is actually an increased focus on how public money is utilised and what is actually achieved. Um, I'm pleased to see that there will be an increased availability of council um, and committee papers and reports for constituents. How do you actually intend to make these papers more accessible to the public? I know at the moment they're available available online, but a lot of constituents tell us it's hard to find out, you know, where to go and where to find them. Will you advertise this, or you know, how we go about it? Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a good question, and the answer to that is that in the majority of our audit reports, um, under the governance and transparency wider scope element, we've actually teased that out. 
So are you presenting the, the, the papers to the public? Are they available on your website? the first question. Generally, some are, some aren't, because there's sometimes there's some things that need to be held in private that's not for public consumption. But generally, for, for example, I don't really think the papers of an audit risk and scrutiny committee should be made available publicly. Some people are nervous about that, whereas some of the other committees, it's not so. There's nothing as, as political in there that could perhaps end up in the front of our newspaper. So therefore, they are made available. And, and there's a little bit around maybe the minutes being made available, but not certain papers. Certain papers being redacted, and that needs to be decided by the council in terms of like with a with a risk hat on. Um, but the second point you made in terms of this council being quite good at sharing the papers online, but then people still not being able to find them, that's an issue with the website. Um, and basically. That there needs to be a little bit, I think, I can't remember if it was actually in the council's report last year that we said these could be more available. Like, I think you had to click through various links to get to, and I, yeah. And I mean, we, we use the website extensively to pull the minutes from so that we can continuously do that review and make sure that there's nothing that's going to impact on our audit approach. And you'd be surprised at how difficult they are to find. The, the, and, I, and I'm not just talking about the and Gallery Council, I'm talking about across the public sector. If they're there at all, you find them by luck more than anything else. So we've been trying to tease that out under that of governance and transparency wider scope element, and hopefully that will then lead through to an improvement of visibility on the website. Thank you, Chair. Um, breaking through old minutes of council meetings, you really do have an exciting life, sir. Um, but the, the, what the question I was going to ask was, can a committee be found guilty of fraud? And how do you how do you uh, prosecute that or, or pursue it? It's a good it's a good question. Um, I think a committee can definitely fall short of the mark in terms of for a number of reasons. Like for example, you make a decision based on incomplete or inaccurate information, which then leads to, for example, I don't know, people being made redundant or I don't know a contract being entered into that's then not value for money. But I, I don't necessarily, I can't really recall of a full committee ever being, being, being accused of fraud because that would take massive collusion. If you know, so that would mean that everybody in the room was getting together out with the committee halls and saying, listen, I think we should try and force this through, um, which I would be shocked if that ever happened. Um, so I'm, I'm not personally aware of that. Uh, so so that, that's my sort of view, my viewpoint on that. No would be the answer. Um, but I'm sure there are circumstances whereby they get they make mistakes. But I don't. I, don't, I would never envision a committee being held accountable for a, for a fraud. Well, I think sometimes you try to get part of political uh, the same groups to agree to the same thing. Never <laughs> cross parties. It's impossible. I've never known of it. <laughs> I think it's very little risk. But I suppose it comes back to that point. So I, I, I'll just reflect on it as well. I hope. Uh, John Boyd didn't come here. We gave him a wee, I would say a wee bit of a grill on last time. We didn't want to be too hard on him, but at the same time, one of the things pointed out to him, listen, is, is the best value audit report that was carried out by yourselves, that the chair and vice chair of the Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee weren't approached uh, with that at all. So you only got one side, you only got the administration side in regards to that. That's maybe something we should set doing it independently. We were approached, sorry, we weren't interviewed, so therefore there was different things going on in both Jane's life and my life at that time. We were only picking up the email, so therefore... Somebody should have came and knocked the door or even phoned us and said, listen, we want to talk to you. I think it's essential. So you did a best value audit report on the Priest and Gallery and never spoke to the, the official or the chair and vice chair of the Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee. We just feel that was essential. Can I hope that's not why John isn't here today. I hope it's for other, other reasons because we think a lot of John is really good. But uh, but I think we need to pick up on that and we need to pick up on the points like to say, if, if, I'm not, if, if one of my roles and responsibilities is to sign off a piece of paper that says that, so we're quite confident that the Prison Gallery Council is acting in a proper and fit, fit, uh, fit for purpose manner. And I'm not willing to do that until I get a piece of information. That's because that should really, I would thought, be red lights to yourself. And uh, maybe we need to have an offline conversation with the chair and vice chair with yourself just about them kind of type of things and what is the conduit, what is the best method, methodology in which we actually communicate. So maybe we can pick up, because this is just a note and report, that's all it's got to come back to, unless we've got, anybody's got any particular points. Graham? Mr so, Chair, Chair, we can mention about the best value audit report, obviously it comes out annually and that, obviously the Council. You mentioned there, you mentioned yourself, the Chair and the Vice Chair, you, you weren't taking into account a number of issues on the best value audit report. 
Well, that, that was Shamar Kandala Council's policy of open and transparency. You know, we need to be looking into that further as well. And Councillor uh, Nickel mentioned about, you know, fraud on the committee in full square. Well, well, that's uh, pretty unusual. There is fraud in a number of public sector, uh, other public sectors in the United Kingdom. But at the end of the day, um, that would come down to a governance issue. It's more than a governance issue than a major fraud within the Council. So, I suppose we can communicate offline that. And no, going on, Angela. Just just come back in on that chair is that all right um first of all i'm quite shocked by that um <laughs> that you weren't that you weren't um reached out to and, and consulted with regards to the best value assurance support um i think that's yeah i think you mentioned the early detail reason for perhaps why it fell between two stools but i'm, I'm surprised at that uh, i think the the way that it's set up is audit scotland and the external auditors work together and audit scotland look at one thing external auditors look at another but i know if you, if you raise that with john i'm sure he has an understanding as to why that occurred and we need to ensure that that's essentially perhaps um retrospectively considered the the, the best value assurance report doesn't actually come out annually though that's part of a sort of five year framework where the audit scotland work could reach out to uh, the external audit teams and, and do that piece of work and I, actually it's not it's not even always five years i think the one the last one was even longer than that before um, for the Freeson Gallery Council, but this one was a lot more positive than that one, so that's a good thing. <laughs> if we've been interviewed, it might not have been. That's the point. And as, retrospectively, in this thing, I think it's the right way. We're kind of going back, and we don't, we don't do, I don't think there'll be a great amount of change, but there are certain things that would have changed in regards to that best value assurance audit report. Uh, so this is for noting. We've made a lot of comments. I think that's been captured. Uh, Ronan, is there any particular points you'd like to raise or touch on? Is because it is just for noting. We could just cast our eyes to this of notice. We'll take into consideration, but we we'll probably need some actions on the back of this. If it's no, if it's if we don't make it implicit, if we don't make it implicit, sorry, within the recommendations, then I think there's some actions we need to take in regards to some kind of a communication set up between the chair, the vice chair, and uh, Grant Thornton. So, so that that's happening. No, go on, go on and run off it. No, I mean certainly happy to facilitate any. Conversations of those. I mean, you should have access to internal and external audit if you if you think that's necessary. In terms of, of some of the actions that we've obviously got, uh, we're following up on the base value audit. We've got an action plan improvement plan there that you're following through. Uh, in addition, there's the root and branch review that the SFT are doing on the Northwest campus. So it might be appropriate to wait and see what that brings uh, out to see what assurances you need on those sorts of projects going forward. If those highlight anything, and we'll, we'll of course, uh, that report will be shared with the external auditors in due course. Jane, anything that you feel you want to add at that point? Everybody else comfortable enough? Malcolm? Uh, it really, really is just, just for, for clarity as to you know, what channels we do go through to communicate the external auditors if we feel the need of it. Do we, do we go through you, Rona? Is that how that works? This committee feeds through you and then you. It's just a wee bit of clarity about what the, what the arrangements are for us to raise concerns and to communicate. Angela's got to deal with that directly. Can I take that question? Is that all right? So feel free to contact any member of the engagement team and our details should be within um, our plan and our external audit reports that come out sort of every six months or so. Um, there's also, there, there should, there's basically every single one of you should be able to get access to Joanne Brown, who's the engagement leader, and, and flag any concerns that, without having to go through anyone else. So, so don't feel that you have to, to have to speak to other people if you've got concerns, and you want, and you think they should be, we should be sharing those concerns. Then please just, just feel free to reach out to us. Um, the, the, we've uh, had plenty of emails like that in the past, and we certainly take them very seriously. Um, so, so yeah, feel free. Open line of communication across the committee to the external orders. Okay, we'll make sure that's... We'll have a discussion around about that, I think, uh, just so we've actually got that bottomed out. So, I suppose, we're not in the outs for the report. I wonder if we should agree to have the... Uh, to make sure all members of the Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee have got the contact details of... We might even have a... a I'm guessing, no workshop, but we need to have actually have some kind of formalised meeting about it, just to... to to have a discussion, we could do that offline. No, I think we need to meet as, as a committee, away from the committee setting with our external auditors, just to go through the, the things that maybe have been missed. Okay with that? Okay, thank you very much. Thanks very much for your time, Angela. Very much appreciate it. Tell John we're asking for him, and Joanne. We've, we've not seen her for about a year. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, item number five, which is a
People Equity Fund, going back to September 18, I think it was with Patsy in particular. Collins uh, replaced Patsy, but she, I think she had a particular uh, involvement with asking for this coming back. I know we've had some recognition through the BBC, I think, in regards to this. Coming across as a very good report, but I'll do my usual blog. The purpose of this report is to provide yes. members with information related to the Scottish Government's Pupil Equity Fund. At the Audit Risk Committee of September last year, it was agreed that a further report be provided to members outlining the guidelines which have been given by the children, young people and lifelong learning department to schools for using this fund and what measures are being developed to affect a rise in attainment. So, Susan Martin, I'm just picking you up there, Susan, just make sure we've got right person. Susan Martin here, who's the report author to this. So what I'll normally do at this point, I've outlined obviously the purpose of the report, but Susan, do you want to talk to it or uh, it's up to you. You can talk, talk about it, say, say what your involvement is, what you think of it. Or you can just say, listen, I'm happy to take questions. It's absolutely up to you. So over to you. Thank you. Um, so I, uh, I did author the report and I have nothing further to add at this stage. I'm just happy to take any questions from the group. Anything in particular you think you want to feel is important that the, the committee should be looking at out with what they pick up themselves? That would be fair to give guidance that way. I, I, think, I think one of the key um, really positive parts in this, uh, this report, and it maybe doesn't, uh, reading it back, it's always interesting when you read your reports back, but reading, reading it back, it maybe doesn't come across as much as it could. And that is that um, our approach in Dumfries and Galloway has been held up by Education Scotland in terms of good practice. And they are now starting to roll that out across other authorities and suggest the same approach in terms of the planning sheets to bulk out the basic information that's available in school improvement planning, but to actually have a bit more detail, a bit more meat on the bone about how the money will be spent how it will improve outcomes for the young person and how that will be measured. So they're starting to um, put that forward as good practice in other authorities. So I think that perhaps doesn't come out as clearly in the report where I'm talking about um, the Education Scotland feedback, uh, that, that that's how far they have gone with that. So I think that's quite a positive for us that, that we were on the front foot with that. No, thank, thank you very much for that. Hands on the flying up. I mean, I did find it very interesting. Ian, you first and I've got points to make at the end. Uh, ju just one point here is uh, speaking to Castle Douglas High School, there's concerns that there's a drop-off from the transition period from primary school into secondary school regarding the, the numbers that qualify for pay. Are we confident we're doing all we can to ensure uh, that, that we get as m the maximum uptake uh, from, of the PEF? Thank you, yes. Um, so we know that PEF is allocated to young people who are in receipt of free school meals or eligible for free school meals. So we know we have one or two families in the region who have an eligibility but who do not take up that eligibility and that's their choice to do so. However, those are captured because we have now been working much more closely with revenues and benefit, benefits section within the council to um, pull together the assessment criteria so that what we're doing is we're making sure that all families who are entitled are, are, being, are in receipt of where they want it, but also that we're streamlining that application process so that families don't have to apply for everything individually. Um, one application to the council for benefit, if, you're in, if that benefit would qualify you for other benefits, including free school meals, clothing grants, which is the criteria that then includes um, the, the fun funding for PEF, um, that will all be assessed at the same point so that we're maximising that um, number between primary and secondary because we recognise that was a drop-off. I think sometimes the young people didn't want to have a free school meal because they wanted to go down the street with their pals um, once they hit secondary school. So it's, it's about registering that they have an entitlement, which then means that that maximises the funding availability. No hands flying up here, but what, what, what I'm quite interested in is, so somebody's entitled to free school meals in real terms, whether they're taking up and that, so they're entitled to the, to the People Equity Fund. So that's money that hopefully I'll, I'll reach them and, and it'll raise their attainment to what, to what they would have done. So what does that mean? So what, what does that actually get them? Does that get them an extra teacher? Or does that get them an extra a book? Or does it get them enhanced learning after school? Does that get them a pair of trainers because they're good at running? Have you got any examples in where, where it's been applied in different ways? We can actually see and how we would actually monitor and see how that value comes through. So we can say, okay, that's quite demonstrable. That person was uh, quite practical, not that academic, and you can see where he's going in his future. He's maybe made his decision or she's made a decision. 
and okay, and we applied it in this way, but that person was actually really quite academic. They needed the extra studying, so to speak. Have you got any cases that you could maybe, uh, to hand, uh, that you could think of even, uh, that might might explain? So just, because I think that was a point when Patsy was bringing it up. How do we know this money is getting spent in the best way it can? Because it seemed to be getting spent willy-nilly, and actually maybe the fact that this this is actually been brought to, the, that the Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee is looking at, might have actually sharpened up some of the pencils as they look at it. There's a feeling that, that might be the case, so... I don't know if you can answer that one, no, Susan, but hopefully. I'll have a go. Um, so the the idea of the funding is that the funding is attached to an individual child. So the, the planning sheets that come through should be looking at what are that child's specific needs. As a result of their um, socioeconomic background, what are their needs? So that might be that actually they can't go to after-school football because if they don't go home in the bus, they can't get home. Therefore, the school might choose to use some of that funding to maybe pay for a taxi to take the child home after football practice because if that's an area of strength for them and that's their social interaction out with school, actually that's really important. And that in itself builds self-esteem and builds confidence in the young person that makes them more ready to learn. So, so examples of things like um, get, get, getting access to after-school activities that they maybe couldn't otherwise. The other one might be, um, we are a rural region. Um, sometimes young people don't get opportunity for things like theater visits or um, uh, live shows or performances or, or that sort of activity, but have an interest in the arts. And therefore, that can be the thing that sparks their learning. And so being able to allow them onto trips and outings, um, but with no charge, because they can use the PEF funding to cover the costs, that's, that's another way that it can um, really sort of trigger the learning for the young person. Um, that's not a direct, here's, here's a book you need. It tends to be much more about um, preparing the young person for learning so that they are able to, to, to learn in the classroom or, or to facilitate smaller groups or to maybe have learning assistants working with some of them on specific items. Um, one, one school, I can give you one good example, it's just coming to mind. Um, one school has, um, they've, they've employed somebody early mornings because we recognise that a number of young people are late to school and if they're late to school, they're, not, they're missing the start of every lesson. And therefore, what they've employed is they've employed somebody through their PEF, targeted at the, that group of young people to go and knock on doors, essentially, and say, come on, I'm picking you up, I'm taking you to school, it's time to go. Uh, let's get you in and let's get you um, there on time to breakfast club ideally if they haven't eaten um, or to think about how else we might be able to offer food so that the young person's ready for learning. Um, all of these sorts of things are happening to, but, but they're not happening consistently across the region and nor should they under PEF because it is about the individual child's needs. Um, and sometimes where an individual child has a need there will be other children in the school will benefit who might also have something similar, but actually if we're running an activity for one child or for two children, it makes sense that others in a similar, um, or have, who have similar needs also benefit. So, so trying to build on it in that way, does that help? Does that answer? No, it absolutely, absolutely is. And for what I can see from the report, it's children, young people, lifelong learning and committee. I'll, I'll monitor that, see how we, how we get best value. This was, a, I suppose, from our perspective, particular concerns were raised or issues Actually, is it good value for money from a, a local level and probably a national level as well? Now, that is because ultimately we'll see how, how we actually achieve best value. I, mean, I think the concept is fantastic. And it, whether it's a breakfast club or somebody will reach their academic or practical uh, high spots, you could say in life, it is about the self esteem, confidence that it builds them, and that whole uh, skill set it gives them to go you know, and progress their own life's ambitions, isn't it? Jane, you're one in. Um, thank you. Um, through you, Chairman. Um, Susan, the, um, I, I think um, having read through this, um, I can understand that it is possible to monitor and to, you know, the questions being asked are, are, are really, if they're answered, <laughs> the questions are sharp, if the, if the answers are as full as the questions are asking, um, you should be able to say that yes, we can, we can, we can show that each school is actually providing um, um, a good performance for each child. But what I don't understand is that um, the attainment seems to be based on um, children in the data sets 
in the Scottish indices of multiple uh, deprivation data sets. And yet, this is meant to follow each individual child. And, and um, as Councillor Howie pointed out um, um, in our meeting earlier, 80% um, of, of, of of people, now this is admittedly as people, it's not necessarily the children, but of people who are income deprived don't live in those areas. Um, and so I'm a little concerned that we might only be measuring those children who are in those data sets, not the rest of the world out there, of which, you know, there will be a very large number, particularly in rural areas. And if I could just go on and expand on that, I know that our committee system is just the vagaries of it. We are supposed to have a clear handle on what goes on in Sipple, for example. Now, I have to say that there is not a single stewardry member on Sipple, not one. So, so on that basis, actually, you know, unless you're going to go and read those papers and really understand what's happening, or attend uh, the school um, forum meetings and listen to the head teacher talk about the improvement plan, you will not have the faintest idea what's going on in your schools and your wards. Not a clue. And so, <laughs> so, so there is a, there, there is, I, I think, um, you know, there is a governance issue where it's, it, there's a gap in our being able to, um, be able to follow what's happening with individual children. So, if I could just, point that out in the general scheme of things. I mean, if I was to go to, for argument's sake, if I was to go to Borg and Ockenkern, and the Borg and Ockenkern and cluster, and say to the head teacher, okay, I want to know you've got five looked after children in your school, what's been happening to them? And I, I would like to know, please, you don't need to tell me the names, I don't want to know, but I want to know what your funding has done. Okay, so I agree in that the, the national reporting, you're right, is in, in the, the, the data zones, and therefore that's that's helpful to a point, but not necessarily capturing every child. You're absolutely right. However, um, what, what, the, this is the end of the first year of the PEF funding. So um, it's coming to an end in terms of financial year. It's, it, the school year is moving on. What schools are now being challenged with is, is that evaluation and measure of impact for the children that they received funding for. So we, as, as a service, are asking those questions about individuals. So we're saying you got funding for these three children in your small school. What's the difference for those three children? What can you measure? What can you tell us? What can you show? Is that starting to be measured in the retainment yet or not individually? Um, or is it, is it less, less sort of concrete measures and more um, social well-being measures that, that are in place? And what is the teacher able to tell us about that? So that sort of level of individual scrutiny per child is picked up as part of the ongoing measures of impact in each school. Um, it, it, it does. So, so I mean, if I, because I'm, I'm um, the stewardry's looked after children champion. How would I be able to satisfy myself that that actual fact that how it, how is it reported how is the how how are the children reported to us? Well, I'm not sure. This is the question. Really, how I'm how, what I'm asking. Um, yes, um, it could do. I think I think we need to be careful because not every looked after child might be in receipt of free school meals and therefore might be in receipt of PEF. That doesn't always follow, although often it does. Um, so it often would be the same group of children that we're talking about. So at area committee, we report individual um, progress for lack children as a group. Um, we should be able to track through that lack reporting um, in improvements. I think what we would need to do is do that correlation between the lack and those children that are on free school meals to see how much of that has been impacted through PEF. So is that something that you would change on the back of this meeting today? Is that something to look at? Suppose you should remind us, because if that's the case, if, if there is a lack, uh, aye, so I'll let, I'll let you speak to that. But, aye, so. Mm -hmm. so I think in regards to your particular points, as a Stuart member, to sit on the, on the Children and Young People Lifelong Learning Committee, there should be an opportunity at the area committee then, at least that then that applied fairly and consistently, and that information needs to be at the area committee. 
。そういうような感じで出てくるのはないです。<笑><笑>はい、OK then.、Uh, so, one of, one of our considerations, do we want to see this coming back is in, in, in a year's time, say, looking at the evaluation and impact again. So, it just it's another monitoring type from ourselves, but looking on an annual basis. So, we're going to do through that, through that full year cycle and some of the, obviously, the points that have been raised to it. You would see it again, Jane, obviously, if, if, you're, if we're still in this, this position in a year's time. Hopefully, we're not. Hopefully, we're at a different end of the seat.、Uh, right, OK, and Malcolm, then Graham, and then we'll just tidy up if that's OK.、Uh, thank you. Just Quite a simple question. I'm just looking at the, the amounts of money and I'm wondering what, what happens with the carry forward balances. You know, you know, it's, it's quite, un, quite unusual to find、uh, an underspend in、uh, education. Okay, so, so what happened with the funding was it came in、um, in financial year 17 18, but in reality for you, student school year、um, 18. Is 17 18, yes, so school year rather than financial year. So, what happened at the end of last year was we were carrying forward quite a balance, round about a million pounds across all of the schools. Now, part of that was the fact that they still had term four to pay for,、um, whatever activity they had in place. But the other part of it was just the time of they've got this huge amount of money, don't want to waste it, want to use it well for the children it's intended for. What is it that would make a difference for each of these children, each of these small groups of children?、Um, what do I want to put in place? And then, where that was staff or specific resources, that then took a wee bit of time to get the recruitment processes or any procurement into place to be buying appropriately. So, it took a wee while to start spending the money in year one. And so, we saw that money carried forward into year two. And we've just finished financial year end again, and it's, it's remaining consistent. So they've spent all of year two money, if you like, and they've still got that wee cushion of what they maybe didn't spend at the start of year one. Now, what we hope that will do is that we'll see them through at the end of this funding、um, to finish off the school, the school year、um, rather than the financial year. But they get to carry it forward.、So. That was part of my question, too. I'd just written down, where is it? <laughs> the, 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 the surplus.、Um, but who monitors? I mean, this is, this, the, what measures are being developed to affect a rise in attainment? Who measures this rise in attainment? And what checks are there that there is a rise in attainment? That it's not just some head teacher trying to maintain that how, how well it's doing and they, they, they want to maintain the money. So, so, the measures are、um, broadly some of the standardised assessment that happens across schools. So, there's, there's Scottish Government、um, national standardised assessment, which has been the benchmark at the start of this process. And、um, that, that assessment will be the one that we use, and that will be the one that the government u s e to measure how much schools have improved、um, as a result of PEF.、Um, they will look for anecdotal stories, they'll look for evidence that's, that's not that. Not that hard evidence, it's the softer evidence. They will look for that at inspection processes. Audit Scotland are now part of all Education Scotland inspections, and they are specifically looking at PEF,、um, DSM, and, and impact of that spend. So that is now built into the standard inspection process as well. So, so it's been scrutinised at that point, but the, the SNSA results will be the sort of hard measure, the high line measure. That will tell us whether or not it's making a difference. Just come back very briefly, Chair. I've learned more about this in the last three or four days than I knew ever before.、Um, I was on a, I was on a, 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 a head teacher appointment panel on last Friday in one of the more remote parts of Dumfries and Galloway, and they were, the, the head teacher who was being interviewed was going on about this、uh, pupil equity fund. And how much, it was, how much good it was doing. And, and, and in the more remote parts, you, you mentioned earlier on about culture and things like that. And I think there is, it, it's, it can do a good job if it's properly、uh, used. I, I think it's important to say that our head teachers feel,、um, so、some head teachers feel it almost as a burden because they want to make sure they use it properly. And actually, that the children it was meant for are the children that benefit from that money. Because the danger can be, and that's always my concern around carry forwards, 
that, that the children have gone, they've moved on, they've gone to secondary or they're, they're no longer in the broad general education. So actually making sure that they're spending the money in the current year for the children it was meant for, um, that, that's absolutely what we're about. It's a really interesting subject. The media talk about it, the media want to talk about it. Councillor Bell and Councillor Drysdale in that order. Uh, thanks, Chair. So the back of uh, Councillor Nicholl was on about, you know, about attainments level and measuring, uh, measuring performances in the school and education st educational standards and that. I know that from time to time, you know, uh, in, everybody's, in, everybody, in every ward, a, uh, uh, we'll have an HMI inspection. That. And, you know, I've read a number of these HMI reports over the years, so some of them in North West Dumfries and that, and really them. It's a fairly standard, bland report on that. What concerns me, if you look at one HMI report from one primary school one year and you get one from the next year, it's more or less only a few sentences have changed. It's a, it's a piece of meaningless work as far as I'm concerned. And if you speak to people actually teaching at the coalface, uh, they, they believe it's a, a, a worthless piece of paper as well. But it does flag up an odd thing now and again, these HMI inspection reports. And that. But I've got concerns that it's, it's a standardised uh, piece of paper, paragraph such and such, says, uh, the schools are the schools are taking this. The schools inter the, the head teachers interacting with, with pupils. The pupils are doing this. It's the same thing year after year. I really think that whole process needs to be evaluated in a different way. We're not getting the, we're not getting down to the the coal face when there's when there is real issues at the school. So hopefully this can be taken back and looked at. I know what HMI and um, what happened in the past was that. Um, the, the education department from a local authority would send up a number of schools to be inspected. And, you know, funny enough, some schools weren't inspected for 15 or 20 years, so this is quite alarming. So I think they need to be focused on a wee bit hard on this in the future. Well, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll maybe pick up on that subject at a different point in time, which is not being people at equity fund accounts with the HMI inspector. Uh, and it's kind of a different subject matter, is it? But it's... Uh, uh, but it is a good point, actually, because of it. It's, it's a good point. Are they meaningful? Are, are they meaningful? Sorry, not meaningless. Pauline. Thank you, Chair. Susan, I have just realised sitting in this meeting that I was involved in a, in a PEF project at Castle Douglas High School, so there you go, for, for um, young people. So I hope I made a bit of a difference to some of them, if not all of them. Um, the question I've got is there's been some debate, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm fairly new to the process, as to how many children actually take up on the breakfast club meals. That's the same budget, is it, as the free school lunch, the lunch benefits? And if not, how does it work? Because if if, if they're not taking up on the breakfast, uh, early breakfast take up, where does that money go back to? Thank you. Okay, so the, the funding for breakfast clubs is entirely separate to PEF. So the PEF funding, what, what a school may choose to do with their PEF funding if they have a family where they feel not getting a breakfast before they come out in the morning is hindering their learning, they may choose to um, direct them to breakfast club or to make sure there's some sort of food offering because often for these families, being in in time to go to a breakfast club isn't actually achievable either. So therefore, um, having some other kind of food offering, whether that's... Um, a fruit, um, a banana, a carton of milk, some juice, whatever that is, for when they arrive, so that they do get something before they get to their lunch break, um, is where they would then use their PEF money to try and achieve that. But the two fundings are, are entirely separate. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So, 2.1, I'm hoping we can change that slightly. So, we do actually, members are asked to note, we noted 2.2, .2, should we be asking for a, a a report back in a year's time, a monitoring report, just to, to cover all the things we spoke about earlier. Now, do we want to refer back? I'll take guidance for yourself, Ron, in regards to the process. So, do we actually? There's two or three points being raised. How we, how this, how would we best affect this? So, so people taking on the point that Jane's picked up. She's not on the simple committee, but she would like to have her input and see how this actually translates in evidence to demonstrate best value at an area level, so you can pick up. Not obviously not identifying individuals, doesn't want to draw down that deep. So how do we actually aye to aid a committee, aye, so how do we actually from this 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 uh, committee here refer that to what body so they can then either look at that and take that forward is it to simple, is it to review standing orders? If you can give us your best advice, please remember. Yeah. yeah, I mean obviously SIPL is the main committee mm -hmm. and I think it, it's clear that this committee has had quite an impact on this in the last year, that when it came before you last year there was an impression that head teachers had been using it as a top up to their budget, but we, I think we can clearly see how it's related to individual children now, yes. and, and we can follow that through. 
Um, I think that there is maybe a danger at area committee level that the individual children might be identified if we went into too much detail about what was being done for them or whatever, but we can maybe think about that and certainly I could put it on the stand and order sub agenda to think about the delegations to area committee and how we got that reporting but in a way that you know protected individuals but still got information at an area level to members. Can we capture that in a 2.3? I think it's important that we do so. Firstly, because Wally's not here, so I, forgot. I should have put Wally's apologies in. If he hasn't done it already, I should have done it at the beginning, but I'll catch that at the end, but uh, he did mention to me. So I think if we can capture that in a 2.3, uh, have you got anything to add to that, Claire? Uh, thank you, Chair. I was just um, quickly writing down what you were saying. I've got 2.3, recommend that um, Civil Committee consider um, the reporting of PEP at uh, area level as, as, a, as appropriate, yeah, yeah. recognising what Rona has just said, and I'll also recommend that Standing Orders um, Subcommittee consider the delegations for area committee and what they're responsible for. Thank you very much, Ian. I think I think that's absolutely right. Um, I mean, can I just ask, on page 38, the summary of our areas for improvement and challenges, is that what's going to SIPL? Is SIPL being required to to deal with these these issues here? Um, on page 38, is it, is it 38? Um, it's... Mm. <laughs> Summary of our areas for improvement, improvement and challenges. challenges yeah, yeah. But you'll get a new chance for that, Susan. Take your time. Page 38. Give, give, give you a moment to. Okay, so, so this is part of our, this is an extract of our education report that we write every year. So this is the annual report that goes back to government. And as an authority, we have a duty to, re, uh, to uh, report on impact of PEF across our region. Um, the money is devolved to schools to spend as they see fit, but it's our duty to report on impact. And so this is an extract of our annual plan, uh, the education plan that goes back to government annually, um, or, uh, July time. So, so does it, is, is that, that, that there is basically what goes back to SIPL to say, this is what we are, we are doing. So that, that's really informing SIPL's work. Is that right? Yeah. Via, via the education plan, yes. Mm -hmm. well, that's fine, that's been confirmed. So we've got 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, I think you capture that more than sufficiently in 2.3. Excellent, thanks so much. Thanks so much Susan, for your time, much appreciated. Hope you enjoyed yourself and it wasn't too heavy an impact on you. So, is it Mr Fox next? I think it is. Just about getting there. Have the mark done. Item number six is our internal audit reports. So, we've been asked to note and comment on the internal audit reports, but the, this is a standing item on agenda for the committee and allows members to discuss the reports issued by internal audit. Kevin's not here today, so Richard, Richard, Mr. Fox is, is here in, instead of him. So, uh, any questions will be, I'll be headed towards uh, Richard. So, we've got main financial systems, according to uh, main financial systems, 2017 Appendix 2, Depart Departmental Financial Systems, School Energy Charges, Appendix 3, Risk Management Programme, Business Continuity Planning, Appendix 4, and Risk Management Programme Benefits in Kind from Use of Vehicles. Interesting one when we get to that, I think, Appendix 5, and what might we say. So, if the committee's okay, I'll just, we'll just start Appendix 1, go through them. What I'll do is I'll ask... Richard, if he's got anything he wants to say, bring to our attention. If he just says no, happy to take questions. And that'll be a streamlined process in which to deal with our business today. So, over to you, Richard. Just on the first report, just to say that this is a routine audit which we do every three years. We didn't identify any major concerns, but obviously we'll continue to discuss with management the controls in, that are in place, but happy to take any further questions. Thanks, Richard. Any particular points, James? First, there's there's clearly um, a tussle going on at four forty. Um, and I suppose probably our duty is to actually ask you to explain what is the level of risk.
From an internal audit point of view, we would, of course, like there to be independent review of journals just to ensure the integrity of the general ledger. Management have said that um, that would create an undue burden to do it in all cases. Um, the risk is twofold. One is that the lower risk is in terms of misstatement of the financial statements and the accuracy of the budget to reporting back to budget holders. And theoretically, there's a much lower likelihood, but a more serious risk that the manipulation of budgetary data can be used in a fraud to try and hide transactions. So we would, we would prefer that there was review of journals. Um, but that's an ongoing discussion with management at this time. Quick. Yeah, I was actually just going to ask something along a similar vein. I mean, I'm, I'm rather surprised at 4.33. Uh, when processing a journal or a sections within the journal to enter input who's requested, approved and entered, these boxes, however, are optional and may be left blank. Um, I would have thought that would have been a key critical control point for journals to find out who authorised it, who input it, etc. Because uh, to me it looks like you're leaving yourself wide open. I think this is something I would like to... I'm interested in your views as members and I would like to be able to take your views back to management as a result of this. Um, because I have to say I personally wasn't involved in doing the audit or actually reviewing it, but I'm actually interested in that. As to the dynamic, and as a result of your discussions, I will be going to have, back to have that discussion. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that, because basically when we got to the recommendations, that was something I was actually going to, to want to be included. So I think that would be an excellent idea. I think is the question really about that. We'll get to we'll get to recommendations, but it's a level of risk there. We haven't identified and we need to identify that risk. Is that part of the question? And are they actually fit for purpose? Is what I think you're saying, Malcolm, as well? Are they fit for Jane? I don't want to hog this if somebody else wants to come in, but it's just a question. Um, um, the, the, just a couple more questions. 4.51, people have been talking already about materiality and fraud. Um, the trouble is that, that okay, it's going the right way. It's £91,000, more, more cash collection legend than is actually credited in the other system. Um, but um, yeah, if it was the other way, there would be a... <laughs> did we running around to the panic? Um, and I suppose the public just don't understand when you talk about 91,000 as being immaterial. I mean, I can see in 91, 3 million, of course it is, but on the other hand, the public with 91,000 think it's a very material um, risk. So it's a question of how you, how, you, um, how you actually present this. And the second question, Chairman, if I could just ask, is 4.54. This is all postings to the nominal ledger are done manually for housing benefit as there's currently no working interface. And we've revised that an interface is not being progressed at this time as it's not a high priority. But, you know, that doesn't tell us anything. It doesn't tell us whether it's, it would be good to recommend it as a spend to save, whether it we would know whether we could save a, um, a, a post and redeploy somebody. You know, it's not enough to... So I think we need to poke away at that one. Richard, have you got any comments in regards to that? If I can deal with section 4.51 first, um, as members will be aware, there was, we have recently reported on the council tax systems in place. And it's important to recognize that the difference we're referring to in paragraph 4.51 is an accounting entry which can relate to year end adjustments and things. The real control as to whether people's the public's council tax accounts correctly reflect the money they've actually paid to the council tax. It's actually a monthly independent check that's done within the council tax section. So we're not referring to £91,000 potentially being overstated within people's accounts. We're referring to an accounting adjustment, which we would like to be right, but we don't think this doesn't reflect money lost to the council. If I can... Do you want to move on to 
That one, I'm afraid I don't have a particularly up-to-date knowledge to answer that question, I'm afraid, yeah. I suppose we just did a rather large scrutiny review, didn't we, on data share and data technology, how it, it enables and the benefits that you can see for that. And I think you've already allowed, uh, again, alluded to some of them, Jane. But it's, well, do, you want, do you want to broaden on that so we're absolutely clear? Just, we'll want to see it coming back at some point. We'll pick up the recommendation. Malcolm. Ah, oh, thank you. It was just a, maybe I'm just a bit pedantic, you know. You know, Jane made the point that you end up with ninety-one thousand pounds more. I mean, and I'm afraid from my from my point of view when I'm doing my own accounts, if it's wrong, it's wrong. <laughs> and that's, it doesn't actually matter which way it goes. It's indica it indicates there is a problem somewhere. And I suppose just to be absolutely clear on the point, so so that it's been captured at four point three three. I think was it. Uh, aye, the, 3344, but 4.33, I think in particular, you were saying that that's no fit for purpose, I think, Malcolm, wasn't it? Aye. It's raising a, an alarm, but it's def what does that that's what protocol do for us? Aye. Jane's point as well about 4.40, you know, there's potentially a power struggle going on here, and really, to just to say, in effect, oh, it's too much work for me to do my job properly is not really acceptable, I don't think. Reminds me about a finance officer's not turning up to common good committees. It's a simple thing in order to make <laughs> uh, proper decisions. I think, well, we've captured that. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll pick that up uh, as we move forward with, with business. Graham? Thank you, Chair. At 4.38, we obtained the report and there were 3,371 journals processed between, in less than a year anyway, um, nine months. Um, we reviewed a sample of 25, which is 0 0.0073 of 1%. So you reviewed 0 0.0073 of 1%, and you found out of that 25 that 60% of them didn't meet, only 60% only met the requirements. So there are an awful lot of them not meeting the requirements if you work those figures up. Be any comment on that? I suppose Richard's kind of behind the eight ball here because I know his <laughs> reports. I'm wondering if we can tie this up in a different way. So when it comes to this particular uh, internal audit, which is appendix for the main financial systems, do we even want to see the points that we've raised coming back to our next committee? Uh, I think maybe somebody from finance. Aye, no, bring somebody from, make sure there's somebody from finance here because ultimately it's not the internal auditor's the job to defend, is it? It's actually the, the people implementing it. Does that sound like a re realistic option for us? It does. I'm getting a lot of nodding heads. Richard? I was simply going to say, I think your comments on the way the journals have been done are very welcome to us, and I think it's a good... If we can improve this area, I think that's a very good idea, so... Okay, so we're, we're almost got a, a, a scrutiny stroke internal body on the day if it comes to it. Let's see, let's see how that how that plays out. But I think we do insist if it we might answer we're having a we'll see discussion. We might be having a, a meeting in June, it might be July, we're not just sure, but there's a, a level of business that we'll have to deal with in the short course. But we'll we'll get invitations accordingly. But we'll make sure everybody picks up on that we're, we're aware of it. What's that? <laughs> all right, good, good, well done. Right, so if we covered appendix one it was all right with that. I think Appendix 2, anything to add to that or highlight us what you're thinking? And then I'll open it up to members. Hi. I'm Chair, if I may just briefly say on the follow-up report, you'll be, members will be aware from the report that the progress with capital budgeting reporting hasn't been as rapid as we would like. But I would just like to note that that is on the audit plan for me to do later in the year. And that's one we'll pick up to ensure those actions are addressed. Okay, thanks for that, Richard. Any members got any points they want to pick up with that? I mean, again, when it comes to when we've got a finance office in front of us, it'd be good to. No, I'm, just we can asking, I'm just asking the gentleman for clarity. Does that mean that you're not processing as quickly as you'd like, or you're not getting the information from finance as quickly as you would like, so that you can scrutinise it? The actions that we're referring to in that particular report actually refer to the information that members receive as part of their committee reporting. And there's been discussion as to whether 
it is possible for members to receive fuller information on capital projects. Now that's been progressed to the extent that there's now a requirement within the financial code that members should receive improved information. But what we haven't yet seen has been rolled out to see that actually happening in practice in the committee papers. And that's what I would like to follow up later in the year. So is, is it a good idea to treat that one in the same way as with Appendix 1? So we'll pick that up in the same, the same item. Are you comfortable yeah. with that, Jane? Yeah, yeah. So these kind of things, so we'll have a robust conversation. Yeah. Uh, either June or July, just depending, I think. I think it'll be July, fair enough. Okay, appendix number three, departmental. <laughs> getting a kind of momentum here, departmental financial system, school energy charges. Uh, Richard? I have no comments on this one, Chair. Thank you. Any members have any comments on this one in particular? Everybody's quite comfortable with this one. That's appendix number four, unless... No, no, no. Malcolm's coming in. Thank you, Malcolm. <laughs> No, no, it's just, uh, it, was, it was actually in your conclusion at 5.5.2, uh, a lack of information to support unit rates, um, errors made with, with accruals, and accruals is another thing that's coming back to a similar thing to a journal entry regime, you know, how much control do we have over that? And if you've got budget holders not having information, then they've not really, in effect, got control of the budget, have they? Yes, absolutely. I agree, but in this particular case, I was had the advantage of sitting next to Susan Martin earlier in this meeting, and the intention within education services is to actually move away from the budgets being held by schools and for budgets to be held centrally, and that schools will actually be assessed in terms of energy charges on the basis of consumption targets only. So you're right in terms of, yes, we do need accurate accruals in each case, but it's not, it's less relevant to this particular subject now. So does that mean in future they're not going to be monitored on the, the cost of the energy, only the number of units they use or something, is that, is that how it's going to work? And surely there's still got to be some form of accountability. That's my understanding, that individual schools will be monitored on the basis of their consumption. Um, obviously, there will be an overall central budget and that budget will have to, the total consumption available to all the schools will have to link into the money available. Um, but no individual head, because the feeling had been in the past for head teachers that if due to severe weather or other reasons, they actually had to use more energy, that would actually impact on the resources available for other parts of the school services. Um, so we're moving, that's the direction of travel. Yeah, that was basically, you've, you've answered the next bit I was going to lead on to about, you know, whether increased energy costs led to, you know, the school budget being depleted. So I suppose from that point of view, just monitoring it on the, the number of units makes sense. Um, Chairman, it, it's really just to sort of say it's a bit like waste. I mean, the public is excited at the moment by energy, you know, and, and, um, and anything kind of green. So, I mean, if we actually poke away at finding out what is being spent and how and why and how accurate we are being, I think that can only be a good thing. So I would suggest that we have a bit of a sniff around this, just generally, actually. Um, um, and because I, I think up to a point, I mean, I'm straying away from this, I accept, but um, the whole green agenda, carbon agenda, probably needs to be poked away at. And if we start at at it from this point of view of this that we're not getting accurate information or the budget holders can't actually really control their own budgets or tell us exactly what's happening um, then I think probably that's a good start so yeah I think we should I think we should get that one back again mm. I suppose what comes to my mind will it enhance will it how do we encourage best use renewable energy so on and so forth the local school we get into all the detail but when it gets to the winter there's a particular light that shines, outshines every other light in the village. It's like a beacon, and it's only like 24 hours a day. And it's you, you, often people are commenting about it. But so what I also encourage people, the, the 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 individual schools to LED sustainable. Whether it's can it's a bigger picture of that, but you've got your your wider national objectives, but we've got our own local stuff as well. So I think it's fair that we do look at it. And what is the baseline? Can, is it a baseline for each individual school, or is it a 
targeted approach across just some kind of st static that would, uh, statistics sorry, that would use. Uh, in other words, a, a new school compared to an older school, there's obvious disadvantages to the older school re reaching the target. Richard? Just to put this slight, and it's not my job to defend education, but to put this into some sort of context. There has been, members will be aware, there's been a fair amount of spend to save money being spent on solar panels within schools. And also, Susan was telling me that now, because schools, and in fact it's the youth of today that are probably more focused on the environment than ourselves, lots of schools are now going for eco-school awards. So I think that, and I believe there's going to be an incentive scheme for those who can reduce their consumption, but in terms of how it's managed, Susan was telling me it's just going to be by inspections. So... I'm going to guess you don't want your school to be too warm when the education services are visiting you. I suppose do we pick up this up in the same way as we have the other, the two two before it? And do do you want to see it? We're having a. I suppose it's it's not the finance team. This would be some. I don't think it would be the finance team, would it? Or would it be the finance team that would report to this if we were doing some kind of scrutiny over it? So we're saying appendix one, appendix two. The lot in front of us, and we'll have a robust conversation with them in regards to the different items that we picked up. Would it be the same type of pe team of people? It would, or would this, would this be somebody from education? My understanding, it would actually be someone from education or it would be someone from sustainable development right, okay. who would be looking at the targets, whereas it's finance and what like the budgets. Yeah, thanks, Richard. So do we want to take the same approach or we're just we're happy to let that one go? Jane? Well, I think, I think the problem is, I seem to remember that this has gone pinging, ponging backwards and forwards between schools before. I mean, all we're doing now is taking it back in the centro where before it was given out to the schools in order that they would try and reduce their consumption and there was an incentive to them to reduce consumption and get some savings from it. But I think what we're saying here, the system is that um, uh, in five one it says the current arrangements for setting budgets are not sufficiently refined to support the objective. So that, that's the thing that's wrong. Um, and and I, I mean, I think we need to think about how might be a better system. I don't know, uh, but that—that's what they're saying. Um, that that the schools don't know enough in order to make the um, the sort of savings that they're being asked to do. And I, I think we need to ask how this can be done better. I mean, it it, it might be that there are smart meters, or it might be that there are. Um, uh, we have to say that the capital spending should be higher for boilers. <laughs> There should be a, a quicker replacement, spend save on the basis of replacement. It's a, it's a bigger picture, I understand, but which we have sort of seen. I, sp coming I suppose what I'm, I'm thinking for, this, for the, respect of, the respect of this particular committee, is that again something we should be looking at ourselves? How big an issue do you think it is, Richard? Is this a big thing that we, it creates a, a large level of risk, or should we just refer it or, or monitor it? I, don't, I mean, they just. Well, it's good in review. Uh, across, the, across, across the school estate. Let, 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 let's, let's think about it. I think maybe we should challenge ourselves to think about what level and, and detail mm -hmm. of scrutiny review we, we might need to, to do in order to capture the problem that is coming through. We'll, we'll pick this. that up then as part of the yes. recommendations. Yep, so you've caught that. Hey, thanks, Claire. Anybody else? No. Nope. No, Forest Management Programme Business Continuity Plan and Appendix 4. Richard, have you got any comments in regards to that one? I'm afraid, Chair, that this is another area which is not as well developed as I would like. But then I'm a little bit biased because I also have a lead role for risk management within the Council. I can, however, say in their defence that a new member of staff has recently been appointed into the section. And therefore, I hope that the suggested improvements will actually now be taking place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Richard. I'm not getting any uptake. I'm even getting a shake on my head. Saying a definite note. That was a definite note from Councillor Rowley. <laughs> no, independent. Everybody seems quite content with Appendix 4. Unless Jane's got a, well, maybe got someone. Yeah. It, it is again. I mean, should we should we in six months come back and say that you know, the, the, the weaknesses flagged up in 4.14? Um, it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty basic stuff. I mean, um, it's it's very detailed. How how could that be? Rona, you want to speak to that? Yeah. 
I think it could be dealt with quite simply just to ensure that the new service plans that each head of service is going to be bringing forth in September, October time all make sure they've taken cognizance of this uh, review on a uh, business continuity agreement and that their plan reflects that. that would be Okay, we'll pick that up and get the recommendations. Malcolm, would you want to say something? That was covered. It's covered with that. Appendix number five. Uh, it's risk management program. It's the benefits in kind from use of uh, our vehicles. So this might be an interesting topic if we get into it, or it might just depends on the level of risk that's there. But you want to say a couple of things about that, Richard? Not at the stage, Chair. Thank you. This stage. So that I mean, that's fine. So. Uh, does this mean the question has to be put? Does this actually mean that we've got uh, people, uh, part of our workforce, or employees that are using the council vehicles for their own personal use? I suppose that's a question that's there. And if they are, they get, are they getting advantages? Are the council getting advantages to that? Is there even, even potential risks of tax implications that are not being adhered to? There's a number of things probably we could look at that. Or is it something that at so low level we consider that it's isn't, isn't a great risk to the council? That's half a question, kind of, Richard. Maybe start on that one. That might be the start and the finish. I don't think we've got to get much up to you. I think the audit testing identified that there is the potential for custom and practice to be developing towards a few employees, not a widespread number, but a few employees using vehicles, possibly to go home with and possibly it might not be in the best interest of the council because we had the discussion earlier there's no question that where an employee takes a vehicle home for the per for the benefit of the council then that's actually completely legitimate so the typical example is that if you're going away the following day getting an early start it's perfectly reasonable to take the vehicle home to save being paid to come into work to pick up a vehicle to say, head out past your home again the question is whether there are people who are routinely taking vehicles home without a good reason to do so. And what we're really looking for in terms of this is not to say they're doing it, but to have management arrangements in place to discuss and review whether they might be doing it. I suppose the only thing I, I'll bring you right in, Malcolm, but I, I think it have, hasn't been picked up, I don't know what I can see, is the uninsured is a potential risk there. If somebody's taken that, Potentially without the real authorisation because they're not complying with the council's policies, even if the manager's saying, OK, it's fine, you can take it, but actually, if it's in conflict with the decision that the council's made, potentially they're uninsured, and that, to me, is a really a really big risk. So, But I do think there's a lot of advantages to uh, members of staff having that availability and that choice to be able to take it, take a vehicle home under the right circumstances. So I don't think if you have any comments on that, then you come right in after that, Malcolm, or then, Graham. Just on the insurance issue, I have actually looked at the council's insurance policy and it does actually cover personal use of vehicles. So that's not a risk. No, so I suppose what I was trying to put in the context of the council said, here's a clear policy and a manager overrides it, hasn't actually got the authority to override in the first place, then there's a conflict there. That would be, I'm sure that would be worked through in a positive manner, but there is, I think, still a potential risk. Malcolm then, Graham. Thank you. It's uh, 4.7 and there was 15 vehicles that you tracked and you re reviewed the, re reviewed where they were, and at 12 out of the 15, you had to ask for uh, further information from transport and the heads of service. Uh, did you get satisfactory answers on these 12 occasions? Because 12 out of 15 seems quite a high strike rate to me. I've not got the answers up yet, I'm afraid, Chair. We'll just put that in the same as we've done one, two, three, and that'll be five now. So we'll pick it up. We'll pick it up as a particular question. We'll get the right person here for the next committee as we go through that, Graham. Yeah, mine are 4.6 and 4.8. I mean, 4.6, uh, the register for home to work has not been updated since 2014. Um, contacted heads of service in 28, November 2018 limited responses were received are, are we pursuing that or whose whose job is that to pursue it? that's my first point my second point is with all these vehicles of 395 and 118 whatever that comes to and not all of them get tracking devices yet with 100 tracking devices in the workshop well if we've bought and paid for them we may as well be in use so why aren't they on a vehicle you know 
I mean, I don't know whose job it is to chase that up, but we need to be finding out about these things and why they're not being used. That's right, if they're using them. And some of them are actually just a device that you, you just place. Aye, it's not even like you have to get a fitter in or, a, or any kind of person like that who's got any skill set. You just set it in the, in the glove compartment. Aye. No, 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 it's for the, the council cars. No, no you're in. <laughs> There's advantages. Uh, Richard? I agree with both points, and you'll note that they are listed under Section 6. Any further action need to be take place. What I've not yet done is actually follow up this audit report to establish whether that's been done. But that sounds like from members' discussion that this is a follow-up that you would like to take place sooner rather than later. So again, to come back to, we'll get a bit of recommendations. We'll just ask Claire give us a quick summary of what's been mentioned, and if we get the right people who have got the right information for the when we actually look at all these, if we can, in a one, Malcolm. No, it's just on the back of what's been said about these these points. Um, I mean, it looks like uh, it looks like you're struggling to get some of these people to take this this thing seriously. So, I think we need to reflect very much. Need to reflect that in the recommendations, uh, just to make sure that people actually do take it on board. Jane, yep. Um, it, yeah, I, I must agree with that, what everybody said, but, but um, people haven't actually also said, in fact, it, the, it's a reputational risk to the council because people get incredibly angry about this. And, you know, and, and however many times you say, well, there might be a perfectly legitimate reason. Oh, well, we don't think so because it's happening all the time. And, and they don't like it. And, and I think it's much safer to have vehicles properly tracked so you can see exactly what's happening. I have no difficulty at all, told Councillor Howie. I, my husband's been tracking me for years. <laughs> <laughs> In a different format, I think. <laughs> we, we can get tracked in different ways, couldn't we? Mm. <laughs> the, uh, I don't know why I'm looking at you, girl. This is a vicious mind. <laughs> Move on, did you say? Uh, moving on, actually. Go to the committees. That's right. See, she even comes to the committees to track me, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, if we, we can pick that, uh, can you just remind us of the points that have been raised here in regards to Appendix 5? Well, I do think we can try and capture all these internal audits. I think number 4 was kind of rolled out, but 1, 2, 3, and 5 in particular. But if 4 was, just to remind us. But just on the last one in particular, what points were made? And them who made any comments, make sure we've caught them. Right, basically, Appendix 5 said, uh, basically, basically, I've written to obviously you followed your discussions, but basically, that you want an update on the actions that are listed in at the end of the report. So I thought that was the, the key point that you were saying that should address most of the issues and also the um you made comments about uh where are we use of use of tracking and, and making sure that, that that gets that gets used. Um as obviously got vehicles but you've got tracking there that's not not getting used. Um, up, update on the actions. Basically, it was the uh, yeah the the points in section six to be addressed that covered most of it. I think. I think there is still a perception in regards to uninsured. Is there a yeah. conflict? And that's a wee bit. So that's maybe one small bit. But Jane, you were quite clear about perce public perception as well. Uh, re reputational yeah. damage. Ah, uh, yeah. And Malcolm, you had someone else, did you? No? You referred to particular yeah. paragraphs. Uh, basically, it was just the fact that. It, you know, I didn't seem to be taken seriously. I find it quite shocking that you you didn't get any responses or limited responses, and that, quite frankly, is not good enough. That clears out. So I caught that as well. The twelve out of fifteen remark. Aye, no, that's good. I just said you could see it. Excellent. We've captured that then. So members are asked to note and comment. So we've noted, we've commented, and we've we've agreed a list of actions, and we've also so I suppose a. 2.1 or 2.2 would be agreed a, a, a list of actions which we could refer to. It'll be in a minute. You've captured them, and 2.3 would be to agree to invite the appropriate people uh, who can, and we'll do like a okay. absolutely have a, a a report, an agenda item to consider all these five and an update in regards that we can uh, review, not interrogate, review. That's the word, and get the get the answers. We haven't had that answer today because of the Ken, okay, it's only Richard acting here as substitute, and it's other people should be here. Sorry, Appendix 3, I had down that you were thinking about a scrutiny review for, of energy use. 
Excellent. Yes. Just, uh, aye. Aye. So that's possible. So that so yeah. we'll put that as an action yeah. as we'll consider that in the chair and vice chair will look at that in in, in line with the uh, where uh, Verona, who's a, a lead in regards to, and we can make sure. See, so if that's a possibility, we can do that. We don't. We're no step in the chase of another committee. We'll do that. In the right way. Anything else, Claire? Was that? That was it. I think was it. Yeah. Um, append, appendix. Well, I've got notes for all the appendices. Uh, appendix four. You were recommending that the new service plan take account of findings of the review for business continuity planning as well. Right, that's fine. So what we can do, we can capture all that. I'll be in the minute as well, and as part of the agenda management, uh, the vice chair and myself, along with Rona, I'll deal with that and make sure it's reported and it's put on the agenda management. Excellent. Thanks very much. We're right on item number seven now. We'll get to that. Page ninety-one. It's out and against the 2018-19 internal audit plan and controls assurance statement. The purpose of the report is the internal audit team operates to a plan agreed at the beginning of each year, each financial year, I should say. Uh, the 18-19 plan was approved by the Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee at its meeting on the 10th of April last year. This report provides information about the progress made by internal audit against the plan at the year end and the conclusions arising from the work done. We're being asked to at 2.1, to note and comment on the progress for 1819 with the internal audit plans as per Appendix 1, and we are being asked to do the same in regards to note the internal audit controls assurance statement for 1819 as per Appendix 2. So, and is it Richard? It is in real terms. It's Richard. Have you got any, any, it's up to you, Richard. You've got the, the routine at hand now. It's over to you. I have nothing further to add at this stage, but I'm very happy to take questions. That's excellent. That's class. So, uh, it's a note and report, obviously. The appendix one and appendix two is the, is, the, is the main focus. So I'll open it up to members in regards to, so we'll look at last year. We can see it as a pair of appendix one. It's pretty much all been reported and con concluded. It is, exactly. Jane summed it up. I think, well, splendid, splendid. It's on track. Can do any particular points, issues, quibbles, or songs of praise, you could even say in regards to this. And praise it highly in regards to the, the effort and work that's went in. Just give it a wee second just to go over the notes. I can see everybody's looking over the notes. They're definitely not reading it for the first time. I can tell by the way they're looking. <laughs> oh, excellent. Thanks very much. So at 2.1, 2.2. .2, uh, aye, so and I, item number eight. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it, it's we're, we're going to see that, and it, well, unfortunately, it's just a heavy workload, so on and so forth. But we weren't able to conclude that today, so we haven't got that. That was a copy to follow. So, we noted 2.1, 2.2 of item number seven. So, you've got an early shift there. There you go. Now, we can let the children, young people, lifelong learning committee resume uh, their business. And, uh, uh, and any other business, sorry, any other business? No, haven't got any, no. All right, okay, aye. So I've no other, any other, I've no other competent business, sorry. Are we all right with that? Yep. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Updates and that.